Uh, so we just watched the video in regards to flail chest. And again, to reiterate, when we have flail chest, we're going to have both a proximal and distal separation of costal or segment of costal bones in order to have this entire free floating segment. During inspiration, the direction of increased volume in the thoracic cavity is superior to inferior. And that suction actually causes suction to act on that segment of, flail, of that flailed segment. Whereas during expiration, there's compression of the thoracic cavity, which thereby compresses that flail chest. So that's why it's paradoxical movement with flail chest. Does that make sense to everyone? Some very decent physics right there. Uh, okay. Obesity can also contribute to problems with the respiratory system. A major one right now is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is when for some reason you stop breathing during sleep. And one of those reasons may be soft tissue enlargement along airways. So sleep apnea does tend to be increasing along with the rise in obesity rates. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. People who are not obese can also have sleep apnea for a number of reasons. They can be neurologic. They could just be physical. Some people might have a soft pellet that's overly large. That's one sort of argument for surgery, but there's some argumentation on that. Uh, people who grind their teeth, there's actually some evidence that if you grind your teeth while you sleep, you may be adjusting your airway because of sleep apnea. You may have undiagnosed sleep apnea. I know somebody who's probably the most in-shape person I've ever met in my life. He's very muscular, but he, his, he started a sleep study to determine if he had sleep apnea, and they stopped him about 10 minutes in. They're like, you have it. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. No, we know what you are. You have sleep apnea. Here you go. Is how that went. So no, you don't need to be obese to have sleep apnea at all. What's up? Uh, I saw a surgeon who's doing a, um, just a local anesthetic facelift, but she kept, but you fall asleep sometimes during it, and she had sleep apnea undiagnosed, and she kept, her tongue kept falling in the back of her mouth, and I could be like, no, 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 wake up, no. <laughs> like, what? And it was over and over again. Yeah. Sounds about right. I mean, that's one way to get diagnosed. <laughs> yeah, we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, la, la, la. So pneumonia, inflammatory reaction within alveoli, probably an infectious agent. What you're going to see a lot is hospital-acquired pneumonia. You're already sick in bed for some reason, and now you're exposed to the pneumonia virus, which is very, very common. Uh, there is a bacterial pneumonia. There's also a viral pneumonia. Uh, I think, yes, there's a difference. Viral pneumonia typically doesn't produce the exudative fluids that bacterial pneumonia will. Anywhere where people are in close contact with each other in the community, uh, prison populations, school populations, basically the same thing, uh, will be exposed to more sources of pneumonia. Uh, with, again, bacteria, we are concerned that the alveolar space will fill with fluid, exudative fluid. And fluid in the respiratory membrane, bad plan, slows rate of diffusion. SARS, this was a really big deal a few years back. That's probably why it's such a big deal in your textbook. Uh, it's a form of the coronavirus. Uh, it's, it's just an extra bad cold, basically. Respiratory droplets can convey it. Remember, with most colds, most cold viruses, you'll actually need mucus, not just breathing on people. That's part of what includes increases the virility and, and the ease of spread of this disorder, is that if you can just breathe on people to spread it, it's much more difficult to contain. That was the truth. Uh, that was the case with the flu virus last year, as I recall. It was spread via respiratory droplets. That was the big problem with that one. Of course, we can't talk about this without talking about tuberculosis. Um, again, what we've got with tuberculosis is a uh, infection of a spire sheet. And um, again, places with overcrowded conditions like prisons, uh, it's actually kind of re-emerging in a lot of urban centers. And that's a big deal as well. Of course, there's also an antibiotic resistant form of this spreading, mostly in the third world. Which brings us to fluid and electrolyte homeostasis and imbalances. You guys excited about this? I'm excited about this. Such a big deal. 
a huge deal, guys. Uh, we're going to do some of this on the board, so not all of it's going to make it into our presentation, unfortunately. Uh, when we discuss electrolytes and fluids, we're just going straight back to our concept of gradients. Where does water go? To stuff. And that's the most important thing to remember for the next four weeks, is that water goes to stuff. So we'll start from this concept of isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. And hopefully you had this in high school at some point, or if not, maybe a college level chemistry class would have told you about this. Tonicity is about concentration. Uh, so what we're looking at is changes in concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. All of your plasma membranes are semi-permeable membranes. They're going to be selective about what can move into the cell, what can move out of the cell, and water, as you know, is going to go to stuff. So hopefully right now we're all isotonic. We have the same amount of stuff outside of our cells as inside of our cells. And that means that the fluid will be in equilibrium and fluid will be where it needs to be. It's the same amount of fluid concentration inside of the cells as fluid concentration outside of the cells. That's isotonic. If we become hypotonic, if our fluids become dilute compared to what is happening inside of our cells. And remember, there's always stuff inside of our cells because our cytoplasm and cytosol is filled with stuff, right? So if we have a hypotonic solution in which there is less stuff outside of the cell than inside, where's the water going to go? Inside of the cell, that's going to cause swollen cells, kind of like our hydrophobic swelling friend. Remember that guy? Yep. Now we're in a hypertonic solution. We hung the wrong bag, it's hypertonic. There's a bunch of stuff outside of the cell. Compared to the inside of the cell, it's not very much. So where's water go? Out of the cell, now the cell shrivels. Okay, now your textbook says there's two major body fluid compartments and I disagree wholeheartedly with that. We're gonna call it three major body fluid, or at least, at least three, maybe four. We'll add a bunch of fluid compartments. Let's look at what possible places fluid can be in the human body, and I am doing this on the board. It'll be a little bit louder for the sake of the recording. You have the bloodstream. That's a compartment. You have the space between cells, and then you also have your cells. The space between cells is known as the interstitium. We're going to consider all of our cells collectively as one compartment. Every cell in your body, we're going to consider to be one compartment while we watch our fluid moving. So cardiovascular interstitial cells, if you really want to get complicated, lymphatic system also plays a role. But by and large, you're going to be tracing the movement of fluid between those three spaces. Cardiovascular, blood vessels. We've already addressed this quite a bit during blood vessels in AMP2. It's one of the reasons we talked about hydropic versus, or sorry, not hydropic, hydrostatic versus osmotic pressure again so much while we were doing blood because it really does come right back at you. What was our main uh, thing in the bloodstream that exerted osmotic force? Uh, albumin. albumin, good. Okay, so fluid homeostasis. I already mentioned today that me talking for five hours at a time tends to mean water loss across the respiratory epithelium. So that's one way that we can lose water. Uh, fluid intake, either by drinking or by hanging in an, an IV bag. Fluid loss through normal and abnormal peeing is fluid loss. Uh, feces can lose fluid, uh, but also abnormal roots like uh, a stoma, for example, would cause fluid loss or drainage. This obviously involves multiple systems, your kidneys, your GI tract, your lungs, they are all involved in the process of fluid balance. So urinary tract excretes large volumes of fluid. Bowels 
normal bowel function, you still lose fluid into feces. And if you have diarrhea, then you're going to very quickly shift your fluid and electrolyte balance. Lungs, just normal breathing loses fluid, as well as uh, if you have burns across your respiratory epithelium, that's going to increase those problems. With your skin, you're actually sweating, visible and in insensible. Uh, you don't feel every droplet of sweat. It's not all in your armpits. You have sweat glands all over your skin, everywhere. And uh, so you don't always notice all of your water loss across your skin. You have a number of hormones that influence your fluid retention or secretion. For example, antidiuretic hormone from your posterior, yeah, posterior pituitary. Does anybody remember the target for the posterior pituitary? Sorry, for the antidiuretic hormone? Uh, aldosterone, ax, and RAS. What last part of the thing? The last part of the thing? Yeah, that thing, the last part of it. The last part of the nephron? Yes, that's the one. The glomerulus is the first part of the nephron. You're at the other end of the nephron. Almost. You're almost there. The tubule. Did you? Sorry. I didn't hear it. The tubule. Actually, no, it's not tubule. It's collecting duct. That's why I didn't hear it. OK, uh, collecting duct is the target for antidiuretic hormones. Does anybody remember the target in the nephron for aldosterone? <laughs> Somebody said it earlier about ADH. They were wrong. It's not the glomerulus. It's part of the nephron. What part of the nephron? Not proximal. Distal convoluted tubule. That's our target for aldosterone. Uh, I also want to remind you guys, how do these things work? How does antidiuretic hormone keep you retaining water? Does it just make you retain water? Act on something else. You also retain sodium. The fact that you retain water is because you retain sodium, which is, by the way, an electrolyte. See where we're going with this? Does anybody remember the aldosterone? That mechanism of action for aldosterone. It's impacting the distal convoluted tubule. It does something similar to ADH. It also makes you retain sodium and water, therefore. But there's one other electrolyte involved. Does anybody remember? Potassium. What does it do? Potassium retention or excretion? Excretion. Guess what? Potassium is an electrolyte. Woo. It is all coming back. I've been playing the long game this whole time. You didn't even know it. Uh, you also have some uh, hormones that decrease blood pressure by decreasing blood volume. There are ANP and BNP, which are nutriuretic peptides released from the heart. If your heart feels as though it is overly distended because of increased blood volume, it will release AMP and BNP, and you will pee more, and you will lower your blood pressure. So uh, ADH and aldosterone are both part of our increasing blood pressure pathways. You may re remember aldosterone su from such pathways such as RAS. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Good, good. Um, and then ANP, BNP. There are actually other things that increase blood pressure aside from those things, but those are two major hormones that play a role in blood pressure changes. And aldosterone and ADH, yes. So the first two raise your blood pressure? Yes. And then ANP and BNP decreases your blood pressure by increasing your urine output. Correct. Yeah, if you retain water, your blood pressure is higher. If you pee out water, your blood pressure is lower. So ADH and aldosterone will make you pee less, retain more water, increase blood pressure. A and B, B and P will make you pee more, decrease blood volume, decrease blood pressure. And even after your textbook told you there were two compartments, they drew three compartments anyway. There's the vascular compartment, there's the interstitial compartment, and the intracellular compartment. And look at these things that determine the flow of fluid. It's the exact same thing we've been working on this whole time. Capillary osmotic pressure, interstitial osmotic pressure, and now we're going to just add an intracellular osmotic pressure versus 
capillary hydrostatic pressure, interstitial hydrostatic pressure, and now cellular pressure hydrostatic, right? Uh, so obviously we have slightly smaller pressures happening from inside of the cell or inside of the interstitium. Does anybody remember how to increase, for example, interstitial hydrostatic pressure? What easy medical intervention exists to increase interstitial hydrostatic pressure? Ted hose, that was the one. Well done. Yeah. So imagine physically pressing from external to internal, and that's going to, it's very literal push on water, right? Cool, right? Is it it's all coming back? And if it's not, and you didn't have AMP2 with me, um, again, I do believe these blood based worksheets are already posted up under modules if you want this practice and everything that's correlated with it. Okay, so overall volume deficit. If overall fluid volume is low, clinical manifestations will be lightheadedness, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, and potentially in the most severe form, hypovolemic shock. <laughs> I hear those highlighters just highlighting every row. <laughs> yes. Okay, volume excess overall. Shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, neck vein distension. Remember, veins are almost always superficial to arteries, so we're most likely going to see distension of veins, like the jugular, for example. And that's just big picture overall situation. Now we'll talk about hyponatremia and hypernatremia before we kind of go back to this idea to the other electrolytes, because zoom tight. Uh, hypernatremia in Merca is going to be a lot more common than hyponatremia. Hyponatremia recently became more common for a pretty funny reason. Funny, not funny because people died, but you know. Um, so hyponatremia means you are hypotonic, means you've added so much water without any salt that you have created hypotonic solution in your interstitial space. Most people are never going to have to deal with this. One way to do it would be to get an 80 ounce Camelback or other backpack that has a very large water reservoir and slurp down a whole bunch of water in a very short time span. And that's when we started seeing more cases of a hyponatremia is when Camelback came out with an 80 ounce model. What happened? Because they have that like the thing that you bite and it encourages more water drinking just in as a habit. Yeah, um, something that, again, this is also something you might seen in like a long distance runner, maybe somebody who's new to marathon training, for example. One thing you learn about running marathons is that you have to get a certain percentage of electrolytes in, the, in addition to water. You can't just drink water. You have to drink water and take maybe a certain amount of salt tablets or eat a banana or do whatever works for you, because if you just drink water, you're gonna end up hyponatremic. And the clinical, what's that? No, this can happen one time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all you need is one. Uh, let's see, so clinical manifestations, somebody who's experiencing the onset of hyponatremia, they're gonna have like tacky mucous membranes, they're actually gonna be thirsty weirdly enough. So they're going to be drinking even more water, which is just going to hurt them more. Uh, malaise, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, headache. It can actually end up in coma and death. This can kill you. Another time this happened was a water drinking contest on the radio. The who can drink the most water without peeing contest. And they didn't know that you could die of that. And yeah, it was bad. I think somebody did, yes. Yeah. Here in Colorado, I was from my house, and they were like making them drink like the big jugs of water mm -hmm. that like go in coolers, like a bunch of freshmen in college kids. Died. Yeah, hazing incidents uh, involving drinking water. So yeah, uh, here's the funny thing about sports drinks is they are actually correct. They are isotonic. Uh, so I'm not going to say that those sports drinks are healthy because they're not. They have a lot of sweeteners in them typically, or they have a lot of artificial sweeteners that have their own problems, but they are isotonic. So you can drink as much sports drink as you want, and you're not going to have hyponatremia or hypernatremia. So, so 
-hmm. The correct balance of electrolytes to water. Does anybody know what an isotonic solution is in an IV bag? What are like, yeah, 0.9% sodium chloride, right? So there's what it looks like at the cellular level with hyponatremia. It looks just like a hypotonic solution. The cells are swelling physically. More common in America, because we oversalt our food, is hypernatremia. Uh, so if you eat a bunch of peanuts and you don't drink any water, that's a much more common situation for us. Thirst, low urine output, confusion, seizures, coma, death. Super fun. And just like uh, with our hyponatremia being just like a hypotonic solution, it just means we've made a hypertonic solution in our interstitial fluid. Hmm? Like if you went to a bar and you drank or ate a lot of peanuts, but you didn't order anything to drink. Yeah. At this point, if you took my class, you already understand edema really, really well. All you need to make edema is increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, decreased osmotic pressure of the capillary, or increased interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And if you are not fully understanding the competing forces of hydrostatic and osmotic pressure, I'm happy to review it, but that was an AMP2 topic. So I would prefer to cover this off screen, if that's okay. Does anybody want me to review this? No? We can find it on YouTube, yes. I'll track it down for you. Absolutely. So we'll go ahead and move into uh, the other electrolyte balances. That was just about sodium to water. Sodium is just so fundamental that we're not even shoving it in with the rest of the electrolyte imbalances. Has anybody seen idiocracy? The fact that I'm putting this on YouTube means like somebody's about to sue me, but um, oh well. There's a movie called Idiocracy, and one of the plot points is that everybody in the future just drinks sports beverages. One in particular is called Brondo. And all everybody, all of this really, really stupid population, that's the plot, is in the future, everyone's really dumb. They're all drinking the sports drink, and all they say is, Bronto's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. And nobody knows what electrolytes are. It's just a buzzword that they put in these sports drinks uh, that all electrolytes mean, and yes, this is back to the topic at hand. All an electrolyte means, it's, it's an ion, it just means it increases the electrical conductive properties of a solution. That's what an electrolyte is. That's how I got that name. It increases how easily electricity passes through it. Uh, and you're talking about ions, and these are the clinically important for us right now uh, electrolytes. So we've already tracked sodium. That was hyponatremia and hypernatremia. We're also going to need to track potassium, and we're going to call that hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. Calcium, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia. Magnesium, hypermagnesemia, hypomagnesemia. We're still going. Chloride balance, bicarbonate balance, and phosphate balance, hyperphosphatemia, hypophosphatemia. There's the one for all of them. Yes. We've got slides for each one individually. Coming up. So now we're not just tracking water going to salt, we're tracking water to each of these in electrolytes individually. Your electrolyte imbalance is based on your diet, your health status, your GI tract, your kidneys, uh, and again, any medical interventions that may be altering your electrolyte balance because you're not always gonna hang a 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Sometimes you're going to hang other solutions that are not isotonic, which means you have to understand what's going to happen to this person when you hang that bag and why you're doing it. And that's why we're going in depth with these things. So electrolyte excretion, if somebody is vomiting or has severe diarrhea, that's going to change your electrolyte balance. Nasogastric suction, paracentesis, hemodialysis, wound drainage, fistula drainage are all going to alter electrolyte balance. So there's the medical condition they came in with, and there's potentially a lot of medical conditions you could give them via 
fluids. Now, my goal is actually for you to understand these things, not just rote memorize them. You have to rote memorize them for your other classes in a much more complex way than I'm going to teach them to you. But in here, it's more about understanding. If you want to understand what happens with electrolyte imbalances, we have to go back to the action potential, which I taught you in AMP1 in great detail for this. And again, it's up on YouTube if you did not learn the action potential in detail. Um, I teach it much more detail than our AMP1 textbook does for this reason. So let's do a quick review of the action potential. Remember that motor neurons, skeletal muscles, and cardiac muscles are all capable of action potentials. And action potentials are based on the movement of ions. So far, so good? Does anybody remember the most permeant ion at rest? The ion that determines the resting membrane potential. Potassium. Potassium is the ion that determines the resting membrane potential at rest. When potassium is in equilibrium, the difference in charge between outside the neuron and inside the neuron is negative 70 millivolts. It is polarized. It is polar. Does anybody remember what ion causes depolarization across the membrane? Sodium. Good. And that's our starting point. That's going to give us our kalemias. That's going to give us what happens with potassium. Some of these, obviously, these other ions like chloride and phosphate, we got to do some other stuff to understand them. Calcium as well. So those guys, they're acting along the axon, right? Sodium and potassium are acting along the axon. We're going to find calcium up here. We're going to find magnesium up here. And so this image here is for reference for where these things are going to be impacting your neurons. So really what your ion imbalances are going to change is neuromuscular excitability. How easy it is for action potentials to fire or how hard it is for action potentials to fire. That's my big picture view of the physiology of what's happening with electrolyte imbalances. So far, so good? Just laying a lot of groundwork right now. So let's start with hypokalemia, low potassium. Your potassium is low. Potassium, as you just told me, determines resting membrane potential. Potassium is also a positive ion. That's actually why this is here. This is showing you the charge of each of these ions in case you lose track. So here we are with potassium determining resting membrane potential at negative 70, potassium being a positive ion. If you have less potassium around, is your charge going to be more positive or more negative? More negative. Does anybody remember threshold potential? The point at which you have to reach in order for an action potential to fire, does anybody remember the number? Close, negative 55. So normally, you've got to move, what's that? Yeah, 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 close enough. All right, so normally you have to go positive 15 millivolts to get to, ne to negative 55, right? Change of 15 millivolts is actually the more important number than 70 or 55. In order for an action potential to fire, you had to get to negative 55. It's a lot easier to get to negative 55 if you're starting from 70 than if you're starting from 80 or 90. Negative 80, negative 90, right? Sound about right to everyone? Okay, therefore, it will it be easier or harder to have an action potential in hypokalemia? Harder. Excellent. So here's hypokalemia. You're going to have hypoactivity. Hyperpolarization of resting membrane potential equals hypoactivity, and you are going to have uh, some confusion, some drowsiness, weakness, fatigue, bradycardia. It's saying arrhythmias in general, that's going to be a bit of an issue and a bit of a challenge uh, as you go through and memorize all of these details for all of these different disorders. A lot of these bradycardias could also potentially lead to a tachycardia. Just go back to your understanding of heart blocks and reentry circuits to understand why the sort of disordered heartbeat is going to lead to potentially a tachycardia, even if there's weakness. 
Uh, decreased intestinal motility, again, smooth muscle, still acting on that same basis. Okay, that's hypokalemia. Now let's go back to this action potential and say there's a lot more potassium around. Hyperkalemia. Closer or farther from threshold? Closer. Easier or harder to fire in action potential? Easier. So, hyperkalemia. Uh, we're going to have, sorry, that's the calcemia. There we go. Uh, hyperactivity. Muscle dysfunction. Uh, and that's actually all I'm going to tell you about it. But again, think of all of these. You are still responsible for etiologies, causes. Um, yeah, you're still responsible for etiologies, if I'm, even if I'm not talking about them. Okay, how do you guys feel about the kalemias? They okay. They're not too bad. I agree. Let's move on to calcemias. Calcemias are a little weird. It took me a really long time to understand what calcium was doing because to me it's really counterintuitive. Calcium is a strong positive ion. Two plus is the charge. But we're actually going to have uh, the counterintuitive thing with low calcium is actually going to be overexcitable and high calcium is going to be low excitability. And now I'm going to tell you why. And again, I had to go to some pretty out there sources to make this make sense to myself. But it still goes back to gradients. So that's the good news. Here's your neuron. And here's where you want your sodium to be right outside, waiting outside the axon for action potentials to cause action potentials, right? Sound right so far? Now, you know about gradients that if there's more stuff here, it wants to go to where there's less stuff. It turns out it's not just mechanical, physical gradients. There's also electrical gradients. If there's a lot of positivity, those ions want to go to where it's more negative as well. Good? Okay. So if you've got a whole bunch of calcium, which is a strong positive ion, hanging out outside of your neuron. That's the key is that this calcium is outside of your neuron, not intracellular calcium. That's where that gets confusing. Where does that sodium word want to be? Does it want to be with all the calcium? No. no. Sodium's going to go bye-bye. And now are you going to be able to depolarize very well? No. And that's why this is counterintuitive. That's why it's going to do the opposite. Overabundant calcium is actually going to block your ability to have strong action potentials. I shouldn't say strong action potentials. I'm saying every time. What's up? High excitability. Okay. Low calcium, high excitability. High calcium, low excitability. So muscle twitching and cramping during hypocalcemia, that's because your muscles, those action potentials are firing and causing inappropriate firing. Yep. It is confusing. I agree. It took me like three quarters to actually be able to teach this effectively at all. So that would be hypercalcemia. What we illustrated on the board was hypercalcemia. Oh, okay. I illustrated a lot of calcium outside of the neuron. And that would be hypercalcemia, and it's pushing the sodium away, so an action potential cannot fire. Hypocalcemia, there's plenty of sodium around that neuron, and action potentials can fire very easily. Better? Almost? So actually, cramping and twitching are a sign of electrolyte imbalance. If you're having cramping every night, you should be checking out your electrical imbalance. And it could be either way, right? It could be that you're not getting enough ions or that you're not getting enough water. So if you're like, man, I've been drinking so much water, but I'm still having leg cramps, look into bananas. Yeah, <laughs> this fancy new thing called the banana. Um, and actually, and that is a really major clinical thing. I've, I've known somebody who was on chemotherapy drugs who was experiencing side to a, uh, side effects of twitching and cramping as a result of chemotherapy, blocking some of these ions. Potentially, yeah. Yep. Okay, so 
hypocalcemia, the whole bunch of sodium, and then the calcium goes? No, the hypocalcemia, so the cause and effect here, right? So the cause is hypocalcemia. First, you have low calcium for some reason, poor diet, lack of vitamin D, hypoparathyroidism, uh, increased calcium excretion for some reason, which could be, again, medical, iatrogenic, could be something else. Uh, so hypocalcemia came first. And then as a result of that, there was no calcium around your neuron, so all the sodium surrounded instead. Does that work better? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Okay. Why hypoparathyroidism? What do I mean by that? What's the parathyroid gland release? Parathyroid hormone. What's parathyroid hormone do? Cal what about calcium homeostasis? We got to be very specific. We can't just say calcium homeostasis. Absorb. What do you mean by absorb? No clue. <laughs> You're correct, but you have to say absorb from where. So. Parathyroid hormone has three actions in the body. It stimulates one of the bone cells. Which bone cells does it stimulate? Osteoclasts to break down bony matrix and release calcium into the bloodstream. It does increase absorption. Absorption where? What do I mean by absorb? What's absorbing? It's absorbing calcium from where? <laughs> Dietary, GI tract. One target is the GI tract to absorb more calcium from the food you already eat. We do not get 100% of the calcium out of the food we eat, so we can alter that based on the presence of parathyroid hormone. And then there's one more target for a parathyroid hormone that would increase blood calcium. Nope. Nope. Excretion from the kidneys, excellent. Decreases excretion from the kidneys, will pee out less calcium in the presence of parathyroid hormone. So now you have hypoparathyroidism, which means you do not have as much or you have more parathyroid hormone. Say it loud. You do not have as much PTH. And now you do not have as much PTH. What happens to your blood calcium? Decreases. I know. That's why we're breaking it down. The more parathyroid hormone you have, the more blood calcium you have. Yep. And that's an important statement because the opposite of that, right? What's the opposite of parathyroid hormone? What's the one that stimulates bone deposition by osteoblasts? It's not thyroid hormone. Calcitonin acts in opposition to parathyroid hormone, and it's released by the thyroid gland, which is why you wanted to say thyroid hormone, but that was incorrect. Yep. Uh, so calcitonin stimulates osteoblasts to deposit the calcium into bone, and what's that going to cause in the bloodstream in terms of blood calcium levels? Decrease blood calcium, increase bone calcium. So it's a seesaw, right? Yeah, I need a chart. Blood. Calcium can go into bone or calcium can be taken from bone. If calcium is taken from blood into bone, low blood calcium. If calcium is taken from bone into blood, high blood calcium. Okay, so with that picture, um, <laughs> and also I had a picture that, that talks about the parathyroid in a part. So if we go from, if we increase parathyroidism, then blood calcium decreases or increases? Parathyroid hormone is going to leach calcium out of the blood, out of the bone, bone into, into the blood. blood. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Calcitonin does this one. Oh, oh that oh, is so that helpful. Is, oh, give me one second. Let me draw that. Yes. Because, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if you have low <laughs> parathyroid hormone, what happens to blood calcium? Blood calcium decreases. If you have Elevated parathyroid hormone. It increases. It increases. Increased blood calcium. Yep.
Aren't you glad somebody pointed that out? Whoever pointed that out, thank you for bringing up hypoparathyroidism. We will bring that up during endocrine again. Don't worry, it's not gone forever after this. That's why starting in AMP1, I started telling you guys about calcium homeostasis and we kept talking about it in AMP2. I'm gonna keep talking about it. I don't remember. I'll get back to you. Remember the worksheets are kind of new, so I don't remember them off the top of my head. Okay, uh, since we're on a recorder, I'll go ahead. Actually, um, this is a good stopping point. It's time for you guys to go on break. <laughs>